We, by Yevgeny Zamyatin. If you are returning to the Classic Masterworks channel, welcome back. If you are new, please don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you will be made aware of our latest content. And now, on with the story. Record 3. A coat. A wall. The tables. I looked over all that I wrote down yesterday and I find that my descriptions are not sufficiently clear. That is, everything would undoubtedly be clear to one of us but who knows to whom my integral will someday bring these records. Perhaps you, like our ancestors, have read the great book of civilization only up to the page of 900 years ago. Perhaps you don't know even such elementary things as the hour tables, personal hours, maternal norm, green wall, well doer. It seems droll to me and at the same time very difficult to explain these things. It is as though, let us say, a writer of the 20th century should start to explain in his novel such words as coat, apartment, wife. Yet if his novel had been translated for primitive races, how could he have avoided explaining what a coat meant? I am sure that the primitive man would look at a coat and think, what is this for? It is only a burden, an unnecessary burden. I am sure that you will feel the same. If I tell you that not one of us has ever stepped beyond the Green Wall since the 200 years war. But, dear readers, you must think, at least a little. It helps. It is clear that the history of mankind as far as our knowledge goes, is a history of the transition from nomadic forms to more sedentary ones. Does it not follow that the most sedentary form of life, ours, is at the same time, the most perfect one? There was a time when people were rushing from one end of the earth to another, but this was the prehistoric time when such things as nations, wars, commerce, different discoveries of different Americas still existed. Who has need of these things now? I admit humanity acquired this habit of a sedentary form of life not without difficulty and not at once. When the 200 years war had destroyed all the roads which later were overgrown with grass, it was probably very difficult at first. It seemed uncomfortable to live in cities, which were cut off from each other by green debris. But what of it? Man soon after he lost his tail probably did not learn at once how to chase away flies without its help. I am almost sure that at first he was even lonesome without his tail. But now, can you imagine yourself with a tail? Or can you imagine yourself walking in the street naked, without clothes? It is possible you go without clothes still. Here we have the same case. I cannot imagine a city which is not clad with a green wall. I cannot imagine a life which is not clad with the figures of our tables. Tables. Now even, purple figures look at me austerely yet kindly from the golden background of the wall. Involuntarily I am reminded of the thing which was called by the ancients, sainted image, and I feel a desire to compose verses, or prayers which are the same. Oh, why am not I a poet? so as to be able properly to glorify the tables, the heart and pulse of the United States. All of us and perhaps all of you read in childhood while in school, that greatest of all monuments of ancient literature, the official railroad guide. But if you compare this with the tables, you will see side by side graphite and diamonds. Both are the same, carbon. But how eternal, transparent, how shining the diamond, who does not lose his breath when he runs through the pages of the guide. The tables transformed each one of us, actually, into a six-wheeled steel hero of a great poem. Every morning with six-wheeled precision, at the same hour, at the same minute, we wake up, millions of us at once. At the very same hour millions like one we begin our work, and millions like one, we finish it. United into a single body with a million hands, at the very same second, designated by the tables, we carry the spoons to our mouths. At the same second we all go out to walk, go to the auditorium, to the halls for the tailor exercises and then to bed. I shall be quite frank, even we have not attained the absolute, exact solution of the problem of happiness. Twice a day, from 16 to 17 o'clock and from 21 to 22, our united powerful organism dissolves into separate cells. These are the personal hours designated by the tables. During these hours you would see the curtains discreetly drawn in the rooms of some. Others march slowly over the pavement of the main avenue or sit at their desks as I sit now. But I firmly believe, let them call me an idealist and a dreamer, 
I believe that sooner or later we shall somehow find even for these hours, a place in the general formula. Somehow, all of the 86,400 seconds will be incorporated in the tables of hours. I have had opportunity to read and hear many improbable things about those times when human beings still lived in the state of freedom, that is, an unorganized primitive state. One thing has always seemed to me the most improbable. How could a government, even a primitive government, permit people to live without anything like our tables, without compulsory walks, without precise regulation of the time to eat, for instance? They would get up and go to bed whenever they liked. Some historians even say that in those days the streets were lighted all night, and all night people went about the streets. That I cannot understand. True, their minds were rather limited in those days. Yet they should have understood, should they not, that such a life was actually wholesale murder, although slow murder, day after day. The state, humanitarianism, forbade in those days the murder of one person, but it did not forbid the killing of millions slowly and by half. To kill one, that is, to reduce the general sum of human life by 50 years, was considered criminal, but to reduce the general sum of human life by 50 million years was not considered criminal. Is it not droll? Today this simple mathematical moral problem could easily be solved in half a minute's time by any 10-year-old number, yet they couldn't do it. All their manual cants together couldn't do it. It didn't enter the heads of all their cants to build a system of scientific ethics, that is, Ethics based on adding, subtracting, multiplying and dividing. Further, is it not absurd that their state, they called it state, left sexual life absolutely without control. However, whenever and as much as they wanted. Absolutely unscientific like beasts, and like beasts they blindly gave birth to children. Is it not strange to understand gardening, chicken farming, fishery? We have definite knowledge that they were familiar with all these things and not to be able to reach the last step in this logical scale, namely, production of children, not to be able to discover such things as maternal and paternal norms. It is so droll, so improbable, that while I write this I am afraid lest you, my unknown future readers, should think I am merely a bad jester. I feel almost as though you may think I simply want to mock you and with a most serious appearance try to relate to you absolute nonsense. But first, I am incapable of jesting, for in every joke a lie has its hidden function. And second, the science of the United States contends that the life of the ancients was exactly what I am describing, and the science of the United States cannot make a mistake. Yet how could they have state logic, since they lived in a condition of freedom like beasts, like apes, like herds? What could one expect of them, since even in our day one hears from time to time, coming from the bottom, the primitive depths, the echo of the apes, Fortunately it happens only from time to time, very seldom. Happily it is only a case of small parts breaking, these may easily be repaired without stopping the eternal great march of the whole machine. And in order to eliminate a broken peg we have the skillful heavy hand of the well-doer, we have the experienced eyes of the guardians. By the way, I just thought of that number whom I met yesterday, the double curved one like the letter S. I think I have seen him several times coming out of the Bureau of the Guardians. Now I understand why I felt such an instinctive respect for him and a kind of awkwardness when that strange I-330 at his side. I must confess that, that I? They ring the bell, time to sleep, it is 22.30. Till tomorrow, then. Record 4, The Wild Man with a Barometer. Epilepsy. If. Until today everything in life seemed to me clear. That is why, I think, I always had a sort of partiality toward the word, clear. But today, I don't understand. First, I really was assigned to Auditorium 112 as she said, although the probability was as 500,10,000,000 or 1,20,000. 500 is the number of auditoriums and there are 10 million numbers and second. But let me relate things in successive order. The auditorium, an enormous half-globe of glass with the sun piercing through. The circular rows of noble, globe-like, closely shaven heads. With joy in my heart I looked around. I believe I was looking in the hope of seeing the rose-colored scythe, the dear lips of O, somewhere among the blue waves of the units. 
Then I saw extraordinarily white, sharp teeth like thee. But no, tonight at 21 o'clock O oh, was to come to me, therefore my desire to see her was quite natural. The bell. We stood up, sang the hymn of the United States, and our clever phono lecturer appeared on the platform with a sparkling golden megaphone. Respected numbers, not so long ago our archaeologists dug up a book written in the 20th century. In this book, the ironical author tells about a wild man and a barometer. The wild man noticed that every time the barometer's hand stopped on the word, rain, it actually rained. And as the wild man craved rain, he let out as much mercury as was necessary to put it at the level of the word, rain, on the screen a wild man with feathers, letting out the mercury. Laughter. You are laughing at him, but don't you think the, European, of that age deserves more to be laughed at? He, like the wild man, wanted rain, rain with a little r, an algebraic rain, but he remained standing before the barometer like a wet hen. The wild man at least had more courage and energy and logic, although primitive logic. The wild man showed the ability to establish a connection between cause and effect. By letting out the mercury he made the first step on the path which. Here, I repeat, I am not concealing anything, I am setting down everything, I suddenly became impermeable to the quickening currents coming from the megaphone. I suddenly felt I had come here in vain. Why in vain and how could I not have come here, where I was assigned? Everything seemed to me empty like a shell. I succeeded with difficulty in switching my attention in again when the phono lecturer came to the main theme of the evening, to our music as a mathematical composition. Mathematics is the cause, music the effect. The phono lecturer began the description of the recently invented musicometer. By merely rotating this handle anyone is enabled to produce about three sonatas per hour. What difficulties our predecessors had in making music? They were able to compose only by bringing themselves to strokes of inspiration, an extinct form of epilepsy. Here you have an amusing illustration of their achievements. The music of Scriabin, 20th century. This black box occurred and parted on the platform, and we saw an ancient instrument. This box they called the Royal Grand. They attached to this the idea of regality, which also goes to prove how their music. And I don't remember anything further. Very possibly because. I'll tell you frankly, because she, I 330, came to the Royal Box. Probably I was simply startled by her unexpected appearance on the platform. She was dressed in a fantastic dress of the ancient time, a black dress closely fitting the body, sharply delimiting the white of her shoulders and breast and the warm shadow waving with her breath between, and the dazzling, almost angry teeth. A smile, a bite, directed downward. She took her seat. She began to play something wild, convulsive, loud like all their life then, not a shadow of rational mechanism. Of course all those around me were right. They were laughing. Only a few. But why is it that I too, I, yes, epilepsy, a mental disease, a pain, a slow, sweet pain, bite, and it goes deeper and becomes sharper. And then, slowly, sunshine, not our sunshine, not crystalline, bluish and soft, coming through the glass bricks. No, a wild sunshine, rushing and burning, tearing everything into small bits. The number at my left glanced at me and chuckled. I don't know why but I remember exactly how a microscopic saliva bubble appeared on his lips and burst. That bubble brought me back to myself. I was again I. Like all the other numbers I heard now only the senseless, disorderly cracking of the chords. I laughed. I felt so light and simple. The gifted phono lecturer represented to us only too well the wild epoch. And that was all. With what a joy I listened afterward to our contemporary music. It was demonstrated to us at the end of the lecture for the sake of contrast. Crystalline, chromatic scales converging and diverging into endless series, and synthetic harmony of the formulae of Taylor and McLaren, wholesome, square and massive like the trousers of Pythagoras. Sad melodies dying away in waving movements. The beautiful texture of the spectrum of planets, dissected by Fraunhofer lines, what magnificent, what perfect regularity. How pitiful the willful music of the ancients, not limited except by the scope of their wild imaginations. As usual in good order, four abreast, all of us left the auditorium. 
The familiar double curved figure passed swiftly by. I respectfully bowed. Dero was to come in an hour. I felt agitated, agreeably and usefully. Home at last. I rushed to the house office, handed over to the controller on duty my pink ticket and received a certificate permitting the use of the curtains. This right exists in our state only for the sexual days. Normally we live surrounded by transparent walls which seem to be knitted of sparkling air. We live beneath the eye of everyone, always bathed in light. We have nothing to conceal from one another. Besides, this mode of living makes the difficult and exalted task of the guardians much easier. Without it many bad things might happen. It is possible that the strange opaque dwellings of the ancients were responsible for their pitiful cellish psychology. My, sick, home is my fortress. How did they manage to think of such things? At 22 o'clock I lowered the curtain and at the same second O came in smiling, slightly out of breath. She extended to me her rosy lips and her pink ticket. I tore off the stub but I could not tear myself away from the rosy lips up to the last moment. 22.15 Then I showed her my diary and I talked. I think I talked very well on the beauty of a square, a cube, a straight line. At first she listened so charmingly. She was so rosy, when suddenly a tear appeared in her blue eyes, then another, and a third fell straight on the open page. Page 7. The ink blurred. Well, I shall have to copy it again. My dear O, oh, if only you, if, what if, if what? Again the old lament about a child, or perhaps something new regarding, regarding. The other one, although it seems as though some, but that would be too absurd. Thank you for watching. We hope you will join us again for more of We.